cow signals. How was cow signals for you? Yeah. I hope you're going to start looking at the cows in a slightly different way now. And uh, like Tom said, is when when you walk past the cow, you'll be maybe looking at more. You'll actually be looking at the cow now. I know it sounds a bit odd, but I think we spend a lot of our time sort of going going to a, do a job and you know and not use utilizing utilizing our time fully and actually looking at a cow and making measurements and thinking, well, actually. Looks like those cows are a little bit empty. Why are they empty? Um, oh, look, they've run out of food. Well, should I give them a bit more or should I feed them at certain different times of the day? Okay, so we're gonna talk about, um, the title of this is What's for Tea? Okay, we're gonna talk about rumens. Do you wanna come a bit closer as well? Okay, and it's, uh, if I may wish to sort of, I've, I've just formed our company, so it's Dutchy-ish Originals, okay? I thought I'd better be a bit careful being at Dutchy College and having copyright. So I've, I've just done a survey of all the other groups prior to this group and um, I asked them what, what you had for tea last night. So several of them had nothing, they were the skinny ones and uh, some had kebabs and pastas and pizzas and curries. So what, did any of you have kebabs or pizzas and curries last night? Yeah, what did you have? A curry. A curry, what, what sort was it? Uh, chicken. Chicken curry. Yeah, Are you feeling well this morning? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Okay, yeah. Anybody have a kebab? No, no one for kebab. You mean, did anyone have salad last night? Anyone a salad? Yeah, salad. Sorry. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. They call it rabbit food, don't they? Salad. Yeah. Yeah. What would happen if we gave um, our cows kebabs, pasta, pizza, and curry? Maybe cannibals. <laughs> We used to give, didn't we? We used to give our cows fish meal a long time ago. Do you, you probably don't remember, Best but we... Protein you'd get, wasn't it? Sorry? Best protein it was a really good get. quality protein, yeah. So what we want to do today is basically um, go through making a rumen. So we're going to make a rumen, and as we make the rumen, hopefully, we'll try to apply the making of a rumen to your day-to-day -day management of um, feeding cows. Because in effect, you're feeding the cow, but you are feeding a rumen. So we're just going to go through the principles of feeding a rumen. So this was our main course. So let's talk about dessert. Let's talk about cakes. Now, who's made a cake recently? Mother did. Sorry? Mother. Yeah? yeah? Other than mothers, who's made a cake recently? Anybody? Yeah? What, what, what variety of cake did you make? Lemon drizzle. Lemon drizzle cake, okay. Okay. <laughs> Are we having it in the next station? No? Okay. Okay. So. Um, who's made it? Who, which, which, any, some of you must have made a cake in the past. Yeah. Basically, I'm looking for a volunteer. I make cheesecake. Che okay. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, come on forth. So here we have it. There we are. Here we have our chef. Okay, so we need to dress our chef up. Is he dressed for the occasion? Yeah, pretty much. Oh, go on. Is he dressed for the occasion? No. What does he need to wear? <laughs> An apron. Right, hang on. You're always daddy on it. <laughs> there we are, darling. <laughs> Hang on, let me do it up. No, don't. I will. <laughs> There's your apron. Hang on. Whoop. Where's your... Right, shall I do a quick release knot? <laughs> I have done, don't worry. What else does our chef need? What else does he need? A hat. Um, uh, no, we've got... Oh, here's a hat. This is the best hat you could ever imagine. This is a ratty tui hat, look. There we are. All right, easy, easy. There we are. Yeah. There's quite a lot of hair gel in there, I believe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And one more, one more thing a chef needs. Bowl. A bowl. Yeah, a bowl. We've got a bowl. There we are. One bowl. And something else. Probably a sheer grab. A sheer grab. <laughs> what what do chefs call sheer grabs? Nice. A spoon. A spoon. That's all right. Okay. And before you get. We need to see what your, your action is first. Can you just do, do a bit of, we need a bit of wiggle, hip wiggling as well. He's, he's pretty all right, isn't he? Okay. So now we're gonna go through making a rumen. So what would you say is the most important ingredient that goes into your rumen? Acid. Acid. We not have someone in there to break it down with? Yeah, well there's acid in the rumen, but what, what's, the, what's the main bulk? What, 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 what's the most fundamental thing that we give our animals? Sorry? Fodder. Fodder. And what's the other fundamental thing we sometimes forget water. about? Water. Okay, come this way, young man. We've got some water in here. Will's going to be so proud of <laughs> There we are. Here's a bucket of water. You have that one. I'll have this one. You all right? I've got a bad back. In you go. Here's our water. Okay. Let's do that in there. Yeah, go on then. <laughs> 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 
it's all gone a bit wrong, hasn't it? So anyway, that's our water. <laughs> okay. Oh, that the, the spoon, oh, yeah, spoon, yeah, mate. Yeah. So that's our water, okay? So if we say a capacity of a room is about 250 litres, and we reckon there's, a, you know, which is, if you think about a large cow, you can literally, if you try hard enough, fit a, a big blue drum in a cow, can't you? Because if you look at a cow from halfway through its ribs, right to the end on the left-hand side, and halfway across, if not three quarters across, is rumen. So it's absolutely amazing that there's capacity. So we reckon the room is about 250 litres, yeah. and it, a rumen, if you mashed, it macerated all the food and squeezed all the moisture out, would have about 160 litres of water in it. So how many, how many litres of water will a cow drink a day, do you think? 120, and she's giving 30 litres of milk. Yeah, so she drinks between 60 and 120 litres of water. So that's quite amazing, isn't it? Yeah? Yeah, so that's that. So what's so we've got water. What what other constituents does our chef need to put in here? Silage. Yeah. Maize. So, yeah. Crops. So what, what 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 is that classified as? Dry you've got matter. dry matter. So you've got concentrate and you've got fodder, fodder or Forage. it begins with th th th. Forage. Th th th. Fibre. Fibre. That's the one. Okay. So we're going to get some fibre. Okay. <coughs> Run out as fast as you can with the wheelbarrow. Okay, well, just go for it. Uh, just put it on top. Yeah, just sprinkle it on top. I'll put some. What do you think? Do you think this just looks like chicken chai mein, doesn't it? This? Can I? It smells absolutely lovely. That's fine. Okay, put that on. What else do we need for our recipe? A bit of maize. A bit of maize? Do you want to find some maize? Oh, go and find oh, some maize. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was like this on his AI course. Stubborn old bugger. Right. Did you use AI? Did you this? Yeah. <laughs> okay, a bit of this, yep. Yeah. Just a tiny bit on that. Just a tiny bit. Okay. Okay, anything else? What else do we need? Concentrates. Concentrates. Yeah, concentrates, a bit of sprinkle. Yeah. Fantastic. You're really good at this, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I thought you were going to get it mixed. Second career. Hang on, we haven't, done, we haven't finished it. What else do farmers add? Molasses. Yeah, we've done molasses. That's that gooey stuff. What yeah, else? I thought it was when it yeah. hit my arm. Yeah, and, and down my trousers, mate. Look. <laughs> yeah. That's I know, never mind. I'm over it. What else does farmers minerals. give the minerals? <laughs> Very good. Yeah. That's because it's Rogers. Where's Roger? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so basically. This may have been a little bit of fun, but actually, this is what a real life rumen looks like. So tell, tell me about it. Oi, don't do that. So can you see what's happening to the, this, this top layer? It's floating. It's floating. So that is actually what happens in a rumen. So if you had the misfortune of being terrible tractor drivers and splitting a cow in half, um, this is what you'll see in, inside a cow. Okay. I reckon it'll be coming out of the cow, isn't it? Probably, yeah. Put some cling film on top. Um, so basically what the cow is doing, she's obviously um, chewing a cud, isn't she? Yeah? So how many chews per between each cud? You probably did that last time. Yeah, so that's, and she does that over and over again. And what she's trying to do is break down the food so the particle size becomes smaller and smaller and it basically breaks down through this, what we call this rumen mat, okay? And that's what she's doing. This is where all, basically, all the fermentation goes on. And as it's broken down, you get something called the rumen liquor, the fluid, that then outflows. And there's no, no surprise that if I ask you, if this was a, a sort of a, a central heating system, where, if this was the cow's head, where is the inlet and where's the outlet on our, on our rumen? Is it high or low? What do you think? <coughs> high there. And you'd be like, Halfway down or something. Halfway they're all low. And that's no mistake, is it? Because that's what's happening. So the fibre's being loaded into the top of the rumen. It's being broken down and leaving the bottom of the rumen. Okay? So when you come to your farming systems and you did it with your... Well, you've just done it with, with uh, your cow signals. You have a look at those. You score rumen fill one to five. So it's important that your lactating cows are a score four to five, but possibly four and a half, if there was a half. And you dry, what, what score would you, do you want your dry cows full or not full? Sorry? Sorry? Yeah, do you want them, you want them fairly full though, don't you? 
Why do you want your dry cows full? So they don't cow too fast. What, it stop, b b having so a big gut it, stops you? Slow it down, mate. Less room to go up through. Oh, OK. <laughs> well, calves, are, calves below the guts, isn't it? Sure. Is the calves behind the guts. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. So why, why is it important that ca dry cows are full? Oh, stretch them, yeah, I remember this. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, all we want, we want the dry cow period for you, us, is a way of preparing the cow for the lactation. So when she comes to milk, we want to make sure that cow has as high a dry matter intake as possible. Because the more she eats of good quality food, the more she milks. The more she eats, the more she milks, the more energy she's got, the more likely she is to conceive. The more she eats, the more she milks, the less likely she is sometimes, you know, if she's the right condition score, to lose condition, okay? So we want a really full rumen, okay? So when you drive past your cows or walk past your cows and watching bullying, you're not just watching bullying, you're now going to watch, look for rumen fill, and you're going to look at dung consistency as well. And you're going to look at chews per cud, and you're going to look at the, the shine of the coat as well. Does she have a dull coat? Does she have a, a shiny coat? Is she dirty? Is her udder dirty? Are her feet dirty? And, and lots of other things like that, okay? You're looking quite smug, aren't you? Okay. We haven't finished yet. Yeah. And um, so just, just to conclude, one thing that we haven't done really is mix the rumen. So if you were the designer of rumen, how often would you mix it? Would it be a hundred times a minute? Five times a minute, ten times a minute. How many times would you mix your room? And oh, there's a certain rate it's meant to turn, isn't there? That's right. What Any ideas what that might be? Because it's something you can also measure. That's so in two minutes, how many times would the room and contract? Would you say? Twice. Yeah. Yeah. It's we would say a normal room and contracts three times in two minutes which I think may surprise you, because I think the preconception is maybe that it would actually contract more because you want the physical food to be mixed. But I think it's the mixing and effects being done by the cow chewing a cud, okay? And in effect, if you were mixing it, you'd actually stop the bacteria and the water having good contact time with the actual contents of this to break it down. Yeah, so in effect, you don't want a rumen working too quickly or too slow. And how you assess, has anybody felt a rumen contract? No. No? So what you do in that triangle that you've been shown, you literally put your fist into that triangle quite hard. That hard, okay? Okay, won't fall over. No, no. Um, and that every t three times in two minutes, that cow will physically, very strongly push your push your fist back. If you've got chance in a crush, just spend a bit of time doing that. You'll be fascinated by how strong. And when we come to examine a, a sick cow, we obviously do a full clinical examination. We assess rumen fill. We assess rumen contractions. Sometimes rumen contractions are quicker than normal. What what might that cow be doing if the rumen contractions are quicker than normal? Also, if you gave that cow a curry the night before, what would, might she be doing? Right? Yeah, so sometimes if, if rumen contractions are, are quite rapid, and then we go and do a rectal with our rectal glove, hopefully, if we've got them in the car, we'll see that she's, now, she's scouring as well. So we can use lots of different signs. So what happens if it all goes wrong? So if we've got a cow that's empty, let's, let's empty our cow, empty the water out here. So here's our empty cow. So what's what's going to happen to our empty cow potentially? It won't turn very well. It won't turn. No, it won't turn. Okay. What will happen at the outlet? So it might block, or more more dangerously, this is where all the action takes place, and this is very acid. Okay. So basically, the acid will flow into the next portion of the gut. And do you know what the next portion of the gut is called? Yeah, there's a reticulum, then there's a mesum, and there's a major organ that we get trouble with in our cows. Oh, we, abomasum. abomasum. Yeah, that's right. And there's various... Who's, who's had a DA? Not personally. Yeah, can I see your scars? Where did you... Yeah, so you've had cow, cow DAs, have you? Yeah. And um, there's a few theories about DAs. One theory is... That carving, around carving, before carving, there's not enough room and fill. So 
that allows the abomasum, which usually sits here, like the pepper pot underneath here, basically displaces itself underneath there, okay? Another theory is, again, cow with a very, very uh, shrunken rumen or poor rumen fill, this allows the acid to flow into the abomasum. Well, the abomasum is like our stomach and our stomach works. It doesn't work in acid conditions. So basically the acid flows into the abomasum and what do you think happens to the abomasum? All the enzymes basically are killed off by the acid and the enzymes are killed off and it fills up with gas. And lo and behold, it, you get a displacement. Okay? So what's an RDA then? An RDA is where it is basically where the abomasum is on the right and it fills up with gas. It becomes non-functional and that usually is a manifestation of, of lack of fibre in the diet or rapid fermentation. You know, a lot of concentrate or a turn out to grass without any buffering prior to grass going out to grass. And they, they are the ones that twist. And I think with, with displaced abomasums, we ought to call them displaced abomasums because displaced abomasums do not twist. It's the right-hand ones that twist. They're and harder to sort. They are. They are. They're more life-threatening. You know, we always say never let the sun go down on an RDA. So if I saw an RDA like now, I would either go back to that cow within two hours or I would phone up the farmer. And I did one on Easter Saturday. I went to see a cow in the morning. She actually had ketosis. That was her major issue. But there was a possibility that there was a DA there. We heard pinging with the stethoscope. And... Um, I then had to go in and I thought, well, I don't know whether there's a DA or not because you hear the vets pinging. When you ping a cow, you're only pinging gas and you don't really know where that gas is. If it's on the left and you get splashing, you'll see the vet with their fist do this and you get splashing, you're almost certain that it's going to be a DA. But with an RDA, you're not quite sure. There's quite a lot of pinging or gas on the right-hand side. And I thought, right, the cow's crashing. I'll make a hole in it. In what that was, its liver was huge. It had ketosis. And I looked in, I peered in, got the farmer's torch, looked in, and then lo and behold, there was a big liver. Okay, so that was that one. But you have to be very quick in those. Okay, um, so that's the problem with, with LDAs. And one thing that I think we forget about is how do we ensure that cows eat as much as they can around calving? So what tricks can you use? What do, what do you do? Sorry? What? You can put, I mean, what we tend to do is, you know, there might be food in the corner of the, in the shed, in the carving pen or water, but if you physically bring water to them, warm water preferably, and bring forage to them, and they eat as much as they can around the time of carving, their body pre-programs themselves to say, right, right, darling, you know, um, your rumen has to be this full throughout lactation. And if that's the case, her drive is to eat as much as possible. The reverse is if you don't do that and she's empty at carving, her body then has got no stim stimulation to want to be full again. Because you're pre-programming your cow at drive. You've got a question, you're, you're almost jumping up and down. It's great, yeah, go on. Well, as soon as we, our, cow, our cow's calf, yes. we'll give them like an energy drink. So yes. Sort of like a little boost before yeah. so yeah. they go straight to eat. Yes. They sort of do they drink that by themselves? Yeah, straight away. Yeah. yeah. I think they would drink anything by themselves straight away. Yeah, and it's that, it's that fresh water, and it's the water. Why is water so important in the rumen? What does water do? What does the, what does the water actually do? Fills it. Sorry? It just fills it up the space. Fills it, but what does water do to the food? Hmm? Shut up, darling! Yeah, sorry? It breaks it down. If you, if you think that the, I mean, Maybe long ago when you did science, you'd literally, if you put a piece of water with some bread and left it for an hour or two, it would break it down. And basically water breaks down food. It's the bugs that help that breakdown. And the, this process is called hydrolysis, which is water is hydro, isn't it? And lysis is to, is to split. So it's the water that's actually doing the work. And it's the bacteria that's supporting that. Okay, and obviously then the bacteria go in and basically get broken down into the abomasum like our tummy. They produce um, glucose that gets absorbed in the rumen, that goes into the liver as an energy source and, and so on and so forth. And one thing just to also remember is if there's any reason why a cow doesn't eat around calving, that's enough to not, 
well, basically upset their forward going, i.e. they might retain their cleansing, they may become sick, they may get mastitis. So we would start to advocate the use after a, an assisted carving of pain relief. You know, you've had a difficult carving, that cow does not want to eat, she feels in pain. If you can relieve the pain or inflammation with a pain relief, she's more likely to eat and be full and that, that's what she needs because potentially she's going to get sick. So do many of you use pain relief now if you've had difficult carvings? Metacam, Sorry? Metacam, yeah, Metacam, which is a longer acting one. It does make sense. And I know one of the supermarkets now does advocate the use of pain relief. And also as, as the generations go up, more and more of you are more conscious of the use of pain relief in lame cows, in mastitis. If you spoke to a group of farmers 10 years ago, 15 years ago, none of them would use pain relief at all. Okay. So we've, got, we've talked about acidosis. Um, ketosis, do you know what ketosis is? Short on energy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So what happens to a cow with ketosis? What signs are there? Their breath smells. Yeah, their breath smells. Why do their breath smell? They haven't brushed their teeth that day? Mm, no, it's not Something inside of them makes a bit of a... Yeah, well, ketones, that's why it's called ketosis. They release ketones, and basically ketones are chemicals that result in the breakdown of fat, and that the cow breaks down fat to get the energy out of the fat. Well, breaking down fat is not very efficient, so you get these byproducts, and one of those byproducts is ketones. That makes the cow feel sick. It goes off a cake okay and you get a cathartic cow and you get because the ketones are broken down in the blood and obviously the blood go to the air sacs you can you can then smell it some people say it's pear drops you've all smelled sweet. yeah sweet so, some boys because we're partially you know we've got issues haven't we girls so you say all the time we just you know we're not good at smelling ketones boys tend not to be so so good you can say otherwise of course we, we've got other ways of measuring ketones you can t take a blood test a little drop of blood and if I press that button take a blood from the cow you don't need to chop its head off you just need a needle and syringe and you just put that in there and a little bit of blood this is actually one I used on that cow on Easter, Easter Saturday actually yesterday I used it on another cow and then the level comes up and we want a level uh, less than 0.8. If you get a lot of ketones, it means the cow is ketosis and she, she's struggling for energy because what she's doing is milking off her back. And that's the worst thing we can do to a cow. So how do we minimize a cow milking off her back? What, what tricks can we do? Or what do you do on your farm? Glucose In glucose drencher. But how do you prevent it? You know, we're all about preventing. We don't want these things to happen in the first feed place. Them, Sorry? Just feed them, right? Yeah, but if a cow doesn't want to eat, how do you feed her well? Because we all know, don't we? Who eats more, a fat cow or a thin cow? Sorry? Fat cow? Is that because she's fat? Yeah, well, we know, contrary to your... Who thinks thin cows eat more than fat cows? Or fat cows eat less than thin cows? Sorry? Yeah. Habit, yeah, well that's actually not the case in dairy cows because if you, you must think that a dairy cow has a predetermined condition score, okay? And basically if we manage her, usually in later lactation, where we give her too much energy, she will then pile that energy into fat, okay? And what her body does then when she calves, if she calves too fat or is dried off too fat, her body actually thinks, right, you're too fat, dear. I'm sure it doesn't say that. But a hormone is released that suppresses her appetite, okay? And where do you think that hormone comes from? The fat, yeah? So the more fat she is over her target condition, the more the hormone is produced, it suppresses her appetite. So as cow managers, we need to manage condition score and you could say, so let's pretend we're five years, 10 years hence now, you'll be, you'll be measuring condition score. Some of you presumably are already doing condition score measurement, are you? Yeah? And the reason we're doing that is because we want to minimize the loss of condition score between when she calves, um, say 50 to 100 days. 
okay? Because that's related to ongoing consumption. If we can reduce that condition score loss, which means energy, because if a, la a cow loses condition, she's lost energy. That's what it really means. We can then hopefully go forward and, and reduce things like um, you know, poor conception rates and poor bulling, because bulling is all proportional to the amount of energy in that cow. So it's fundamental to, to, to ongoing cow. And just while we, before we go, in, go inside to the uh, cinema drone where you're going to do your full performance, has, have any of you, um, is, does he look worried? No. Um, have any of you seen these? Yeah, a ketosis bolus. Any of you use them? You've got one in you, have you? No, okay. Um, so yeah, this is, this is called, thank you, this is called a kekstone bolus. Okay, so who, who uses these now? No? You, you, yeah? Yeah? And tell me about them. Tell, tell the others about them. How do you use them? What do they do? Oh, they got wings to stop them coming back up and then to stop them chugging back up and every... Yeah, so they go down that way. A disc is released. Yeah, there's, there's a chemical, so the, the slightly acid conditions of the room breaks down that chemical. Okay, which is called menens, and you put it in the gun, that's right. And what happens next? What does it do to the cow? Yeah, yeah. So what it does, this this chemical in here, some of some of you others will know. There was a chemical years ago called menensin. Have you heard of menensin? Menensin? No. And what that does, it actually changes the type of bacteria in the rumen. Okay. And there are three sorts of um, there are three sorts of bacteria in the rumen that produce different parts of the diet. There's a rumen that predisposes to milk fat, and there's one that does protein. And it's the one that does protein that is um, integral in energy. So basically what this does, it promotes more of the energy producing bugs, okay? So you put this into your dry cow three weeks before calving. And that, that then has an effect of about 120 20 days of, of that period. So it goes 90 days into that, like that lactation so that's the that's the uh, the vulnerable period I say so why do we put it in three weeks before we carve do you think yeah or what, what what what's this actually doing what did I say what's it changing yeah it's changing the bugs and it takes about three weeks to change the population of bugs and isn't it interesting that the transition period for those people who do transition periods is about three weeks okay so that changes the bugs and they those bugs more likely to produce glucose for the cow so it helps the fat cows so this young lady do you get you meant to give it to fatter cows um, cows that have taken a long time to get in calf um, older heifers that are usually inherently fat um, you can put it in cows with twins the vet scans twins sometimes you can put it in with cows with yonis okay you've served it to a bull bull breed I hope but her ability to mobilise energy is less as well, so you help her out. And you reduce ketosis by around about 70% in all the allied things like DAs. And because you're, you're looking at energy, it does actually have an effect on milk yield as well. But, you know, be aware of it. Speak to your vet or your nutritional advisor about that. You wouldn't have to use it, you'd probably use it in 5 10% of your cows. If you were using it in all of your cows, I'd be really worried. So it was just a management aid, and that's been around for about six months now. We, we Shepton Vets, we did the trial in the UK. So we found, um, on average, there was a 300 litre increase in milk. So we've had some farmers come to us and want one for each cow, and we've told them to take a walk. Because if you know people like the consumers saw that we were administering boluses to every cow, they probably wouldn't like it. Okay. And just finishing off with um, dry cows as well. You've all seen tripe, haven't you? Have you eaten tripe lately? No? So that's, that's the little finger-like projections on the rumen. Okay. So what we're doing in the dry period, by the way we feed our cows, if we give them starch in the dry period, that actually makes the, the finger projections increase. And we can increase the surface area of those finger-like projections by a factor of five. And if we increase the, the surface area of them, we're more able to absorb the, the, what we call the volatile fatty acids, the breakdown products of food, quickly. If we absorb them quickly, it has less effect on 
the, the, the acidity of that rumen, okay? So you don't drop the acid as much if you've got good, good papillae. And you do that by providing starch in your dry cow period. That's why you give them maize or, or other concentrates in your dry, if you've got higher yielding cows. If you've got grass-based cows, you give them grass when they're dry. You put them on grass. It depends on your dry cow system. We've been doing dry cow <coughs> talks with NWF and you know some people keep their dry cows with their cows and some people put them on decab. It depends on your system. There's so many different ways. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. You don't want to overcomplicate anything. Okay? So if you follow Chef, we're just finishing here, okay? Oh, lovely. Okay, so this is real life stuff. I just want you to picture the scene coming down from Somerset last night with this in the car. I drove and I puffed. It was approximately every five minutes <laughs> with air freshener. It wasn't good. Anyway, they've survived their ordeal, okay? So here we have a rumen, okay? And the abomasum. Okay, this is from a car, so proportionally the abomasum is a lot bigger, but just put it in perspective. What's this thing here? Anyone? Uh, yeah, you need to come close, you won't be able to see properly. Okay. Do you know what this thing is here? We sometimes forget that that's an inner cow sometimes. If you don't know what this is, do you know what this big organ is here? A liver, yeah. And I think when we, when we manage our cows, we almost forget our cows have a liver. And when we're feeding our cows, I, I see we're managing that liver. We make sure that liver is, it's, it's, it's a generator in that cow. If we don't manage the liver, we don't manage the cow, okay? And if you think, the liver, if you look at the right hand side of the cow, um, the liver literally is, is that big. And when I opened that cow up the other day, I opened up just behind its, its last rib, the rib liver basically came from its diaphragm all the way to my incision, because it was full of fat, basically, okay? Um, so it's important to have good room and fill, offer your cows lots of fresh water. And do you know what this is? You know what this is, don't you? Is that the reproductive tract? Yeah, so that's cervix, uterine body, uterine horn. So why is this related to that? And I've alluded to that already. If we manage room and health and we manage body condition score through good, good rationing and good <coughs> nutrition and good dry matter intake, the likelihood of getting cows budding early and getting good conceptions is so much better as well, okay? And then hopefully we'll get one of these things. So this is an example. Can you all see a small one? You can come closer. So this is a six week embryo, okay? And this is a 10 week embryo. Can you see the difference in growth? The speed of growth in those embryos, okay? Do you know what this area is here? The other area. We've got what we call the amnion, the egg sac. Um, do you know what this is going to be? This, this membrane here, what's yeah, that going to be? Yeah, it's going to be the placenta. Can you see how long it is? Yeah? The cow is very clever. 28 days of gestation, the cow has pushed her placenta. If I turn it around there, just pretend it's there. So if that embryo's there, she's pushed placenta, if the embryo's there, she's pushed placenta up this horn, and she's also pushed placenta all the way up the other horn in anticipation of the requirement of the uterus as it gets bigger. So in the past, we all thought, oh, the cow, as the calf gets bigger, the placenta gets bigger. Well, it does, but she's almost laid the foundations for where the placenta's gonna go at 25, 28 days of gestation. And you can see that on the scanner when we scan them. Okay? You're now allowed, after you wash your hands, if you've touched anything dodgy, some cake and tea and coffee. Okay? Cool. And if you've got any questions, there's going to be a question and answer session at the end, okay?